Well, good evening, everyone. It's really good to see you on the Monday of Reading Week. Thank you so much for coming this evening. And a very warm welcome to this event organized by the European Institute, I have to say. And, and we at WPS sort of hitched a ride uh, on it. So thank you very much to the European Institute. This event, as you all know, is part of LSE's celebration of Black History Month. And we are honored and thrilled to be a part of it. My name is Joanna Lewis, and I'm director of the Women, Peace and Security Centre at LSE, and also a historian. And it's really a pleasure to see so many of you here in the room, and also uh, online. So before we start, just a little bit of housekeeping to let you know about the format. Uh, we've got two 20, 25-minute uh, presentations, and then that will leave a good chunk of time for uh, questions. Well, in terms of uh, today's event for Black History Month, it might be the 30th of October, but I think we have saved the best to last uh, for you. The title for today, then, is Black Feminism in Europe, Celebrating Our Sisters, Saluting Our Sisters, Honouring the Matriarchs of the Movement. What a title. Um, this evening's speakers will be exploring with you the role of black women in social, cultural, and political movements, both historically and in our time. So I want to um, now introduce our first... Well, I'm going to introduce actually both our speakers, and it's such an architecture of achievement here that it's going to take me quite a while to, to get through at least even a sample uh, of, of what they've achieved. So our first speaker tonight is going to be Dr. Mame Fatou Niang, who I'm sure doesn't need much of an introduction from the likes of me. But she's Associate Professor uh, of French and Francophone Studies at the Carnegie Mellon University. She's also Founder and Director of the Center for Black European Studies and the Atlantic. She's also Artist-in-Residence at the Atelier Medicis. Uh, and currently she is... I mean, it just goes on, but she's also visiting Melodia E. Jones, Endowed Chair in French Studies at the University of Buffalo. She has published extensively two major monographs I want to draw your attention to, Identité Française, published in 2020, Universalism, published in 2022. And more recently, she has published in the prestigious journal Contemporary French and Francophone Studies, an article entitled Innocence, Ignorance et Arrogance, Les Trois Grâces de l'Anti-Noirité, sorry, de l'Anti-Noirité en France, and most recently in the Contemporary French Civilization Journal, Mémoire Céramique, La Fresque du Palais, Bourbon ou le Grand Dérangement Mémorial. I'm equally delighted and honoured to present to you Dr. S.M. Rodriguez, who is associate, sorry, Assistant Professor at the Department of Gender Studies, LSE. They have held academic posts, include many academic posts, including at Hofstra University, Stony Brook University, the State University of New York, also, they've been director of LGBTQ plus studies, Hofstra University, and they are the author of the acclaimed The Economies, Economies of Queer Inclusion, Transnational Organizing for LGBTQI Rights in Uganda. Also forthcoming, and we'll be hearing more about this this evening, is their monograph entitled Abolition in the Academy. Scholar Activists in the Global Movement for Penal Abolition. Their research uh, is so fascinating, it joins anti-carceral, black and trans feminist approaches to the projection onto the body as an action um, and to interrogate sex as a um, political weapon. She's also, uh, they are also um, researching on healing, justice and transformation formative change-making in queer of colour communities. So we have just a wealth of achievement here, expertise and wonderful scholarship to discuss with you this evening. So, malheureusement, 
uh, Dr. Mami Fatou Nyang could not join us in, in person um, for uh, serious, uh, tragic uh, circumstances. But we are so grateful to her for managing to be with us uh, today uh, online. We miss you in person, but we are so thankful that you are still here with us. So let's give a huge round of applause and a big welcome to Dr. Mame Fatou Nyang. So I wanted to extend my gratitude um, to Rishi Kayadav, uh, Carolina Stern, and Joanna Lewis for this wonderful introduction and for curating a little magic around this event. And, and thank my colleague, uh, Essien Rodriguez. I really, really wanted to meet you, but like I, like I say, there's always ways to return to, um, to, to London. Um, of course, I, I would have loved to be physically with you in London, but like I had planned, but thanks to technology, we are still able to, uh, to, to share this, this beautiful theme, celebrating our sisters, um, saluting our sisters and honoring matriarchs of, of movement. I'm happy to be here and to share with you some of these reflections that make the acknowledgement um, part of the introduction and the second chapter of my upcoming book, uh, project reformulation of um, blackness in 21st century France. This talk, as well as the book, um, are dedicated to my maternal grandmother, Aminata J, who transitioned last year. Grandma didn't know how to read and write, but she rocked her world and ours. Born in Rouen in the Department of Loire in 1925, she belonged to the fifth generation of women who ensured that our family in the Beaujolais would keep a vibrant sense of Saint-Louis du Sénégal, our home before metropolitan France. My grandmother raised me and I owe her my earliest understanding of my situation growing up in France as a seventh generation citizen, hounded by a question that followed me like a second skin. D'où viens-tu? Where are you from? I also owe my grandmother a deep understanding of artistic practices as undeniably tied to practices of the everyday and the experience of life itself. She could not imagine that one needed an atelier, brushes, and formal education at a famous school or école to be an artist, as the world and everyday life serve both as an, her atelier and her canvas. My grandmother taught me well off a language that I spoke before I learned how to speak French. She also ensured me, taught me the history of my family, a history that, that looked seemingly chaotic from the outside, but a history, a history of displacement, poverty, death, and erasure that was also a narrative of birth, life, constant adaptation to changes, a narrative of communication and flows between humans and non-humans, a text that resonated with others in multiple universes, a canvas whose vastness went way beyond the borders of the Republic and those of the French nation state. I also dedicate this moment to my student, Yesena fernandez Selye. Yesi, we are all stunned by your sudden departure, and it seems entirely too soon to speak of you in the past, as your loud laughter seems to follow those who've known you remembering, honoring, and healing were at the center of your time in this realm. We will make sure to continue working with you as you transition to your next cycle. In the wall of tradition, next slide please, those who are no longer with us in flesh are still with us. As Senegalese poet Bira Gojo beautifully wrote in his 1960 poem, Souffle, les morts ne sont pas morts, ils sont dans l'ombre qui s'éclaire, et dans l'ombre qui s'épaissit. Les morts ne sont pas sous la terre, ils sont dans l'arbre qui frémit, ils sont dans le bois qui gémit, ils sont dans l'eau qui coule, ils sont dans la case, ils sont dans la foule. Les morts ne sont pas morts. The dead are not dead. So I imagine this talk as a sort of retrospective of 18 years of research on the question noire in France, the black question in France. A retrospective framed through the study of history power and silence 
and the disorder brought by black women voices in France and in the French sphere. I am part of a generation of French, of foreign descent, as we are called in France, students who left France in the mid 2000s, mainly to go to the United States of America and for some of us to Canada. I am part of a generation that was both stunned, petrified, but also profoundly energized by the racism and anti-Muslimness of the Sarkozy years. A generation that took then president Nicolas Sarkozy to his words, la France, on l'aime ou on la quitte. France, you love it or you leave it. We left. I landed at Brown University where I had my very first class in the United States on August 28, 2006. At the end of that very first session on Africana literature, I had never heard the word Africana before, by the way. The professor, Dr. Trika Rose, addressed out the little group of French exchange students, the seven of us. We're glad that you're here. We would love to hear you on French thought and Fanon. We rapidly glanced at the syllabus and nodded in agreement, not having a single clue who Fanon was. I, like many of my companions, was a product of the Classe Préparatoire Littéraire, a two-year rigorous academic program that acquaints French students with canonical figures of our humanities. Yet, the name Fanon was unknown. Over the next weeks, I read Zora Neale Hurston, James Baldwin, Richard Wright, Edouard Brathwaite, but I also read for the first time Aimé Césaire, Franz Fanon, Marie Scondé, Asia Jebar, Robert Hort, Edouard Glissant, names that I had never heard of in France. These were French artists, writers, thinkers, people like me who were born from France's colonial history. People who were writers, people who were thinking about what it was to be French, but in the margin, to be French and erased from national consciousness, national history, to be erased from the family's photo album. I was the school girl who regularly scored first prize in French history from primary school to high school. And yet I heard of Toussaint Louverture and the Haitian revolution for the first time in the United States. At Brown University, I learned that my country abolished slavery in 794, light years away from 1848, the year that the Education Nationale, the national school system, religiously drilled in my head. I learned of solitude, of the Bumidum, of Charoy 44, and the fight for liberation in the French Caribbean. I learned of Sarge Bartman, the 19th century Black Venus, who was paraded around freak shows in London and Paris before her brain, skeleton, and sex organs remain on display in a Paris museum until 1974. I discovered, 1994, sorry. I discovered that pillars of the French Enlightenment of the revolution of 1789 and of, and of our revered Third Republic, great names who crafted our Republican traditions and universalist values were also fierce anti-abolitionist advocating for the, in, the inferiority of subjects of the French empire based on racial prejudice. My time in the United States at Brown University had been illuminating, exciting, intriguing, it has also set the tone of my vision as an educator for the next 18 years and grounded my research around pivotal questions. How? How was it possible? How was it possible that French canonical humanities left so many of these names, dates, and events behind? How did that erasure affect the making of France as well as the, you know, the very contemporary processes of integration or exclusion from the national community? And silencing this past, how do we reconsider French modernity in all its contradiction and limitation in a bid to ultimately propose a reading of France that remains true to its present and the past that crafted Frenchness and French society? So I will use here um, some of the cases from my scholarship, art and public scholarship that I develop in, in, in this book to highlight critical articulation between race, ethnicity, gender and citizenship in contemporary France, as well as uh, some of the common trope that, that define, um, I'm tempted to 
almost say that condition, right? Um, the integration of Black French or Black people in France to the national community, an integration that is contingent to the expression of gratitude. Participation to public debates in France for Black people is conditioned to the expression of neutrality, not saying anything, remaining mute, or the display of gratitude towards the Republic. Any criticism or attempt to bring a new agenda is met with stern rebuttal and the affirmation of one's irrevocable alienness, ungratefulness, or dangerousness. In previous work, I have argued it was the case for one of the articles that was mentioned, um, Innocence, Ignorance, Arrogance, the Three Graces of French Anti-Blackness. I argue that French systemic racism is premised on what I call ghost racism, the refusal to consider race as a valid category of analysis when race functions in France precisely as an instantaneous element of unquestionable and natural belonging to the national group for white people and an indelible mark of foreignness, probationary acceptance or impossible inclusion in the case of non-whites. French racelessness effectively functions as an ideology ensuring that racism racial thinking and their effects are rendered invisible for the non-racialized while racialized subjects navigate the everyday according to their manifestation um and one of the examples that i'm that i use in the book is um my my film marianne noir that came out in 2016 so marianne is the embodiment of the republic and you know noir blackness and we don't say right we have this issue with saying um black when associated with with, with people and um so the the movie was met with a lot of criticism and violent criticism even online not just from from far right movement but sometimes from you know people from the left who will beg me uh, not to import in france this you know because i lived in america this american view of of race and in a very interesting conversation that's actually online at the um, America, uh, the, the French uh, consulate in uh, San Francisco, a woman, a French woman begged me, I quote, not to bring this virus, this bacteria of race in France. And, and then I asked her, okay, so we don't have, what's the color of, of, the, 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 of Marianne? And she told me Marianne doesn't have a color. The color of Marianne is the Republic. When I started analyzing that, and I realized, you know, since 1792, every year in France, a woman is chosen to embody Marianne. We've had, you know, several of them. Um, I can think of, um, you know, Isabel, um, um, you know, famous models uh, be, being Marianne. And, and in 2013, a Ukrainian woman who had been in France for 18 days, three hours, Ina Shevchenko, she was the leader of the feminine movement, was chosen to represent Marianne. And nobody, actually, some people complained, but they were more complaining because of the fact that, you know, she would flash, um, <laughs> splatter blood, uh, red paint in church or flash her boobs in church. So people complain more about that than about the fact that she was not French. She's been in France for less than a week when she was chosen to represent uh, Marianne in 2013 for Georges de la Haye. For, uh, for David Cowena and Olivier Siapa. And then my question becomes, how can this woman who is not French, who's been in the country for a couple of weeks, can be something that any of the seven women in my movie, um, Alice Job, Isabelle Bonnie-Clavry, cannot be? What's the difference between them? And when you say that the difference is, is clear, right? It, it has to do with that thing that we cannot uh, talk about in France, the, the question of race. Um, another example that I that I study, so uh, my film Marianne Noir was the, this three intense debate in 2019, in the spring of 2019 in France around the, um, the, the parliament fresco. So we are in France in a country where um, you know, it's it's starting. This is what, what we are working on. But the conversation around the memory of slavery in school, we don't learn about that. I mean, my entire memory, my entire um, mental representation of slavery growing up in, 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 in France was the United States, right? We learn of slavery through roots. When we think of slavery, we think of, you know, plantations in uh, Mississippi. We don't think of habitation in the Antilles, right? So um, there is one monument to commemorate the abolition of slavery in France. It's this. Uh, next slide, please. 
Yes. So this is the monument at the French Parliament to commemorate the abolition of 1794. I discovered this when I went to screen my movie at the French Parliament. I could not believe what I was seeing. And I absolutely could not believe it when I realized that this was the monument commemorating the abolition of slavery. So with my colleague Julien Ciodo, we wrote a letter to the uh, president of the French Parliament, asking him um, and to uh, the, the all our deput uh, the MPs, asking them, it was a simple question, do you think that this work of art is the best is the, to commemorate the abolition of slavery? And that opened an insane sequence of three um, weeks with more than 300 articles in the French press, in French media, and out of all of that, I mean, I had my student do an analysis, only two, <laughs> not I'm not saying was sided with us, but try to understand what we we're talking about. The condemnation was unanimous from the far right to the far left. And I will share on the, on the next slide some of the things that we heard. And this is all of this is available online from Le Monde, Le Figaro, um, the Ministère de la Culture. So this is how the artist draws his lips. That's not true. We, and we can discuss this later in the um, the, the uh, Q&A, I had my student go through his entire um, uh, catalog and actually a two second Google uh, search shows that it's not true. The artwork had been there for 18 years, nobody complained. Um, it commemorates the abolition of slavery. So by essence, it cannot be racist. Black people commonly have big lips. Um, the fresco is at the national, rep um, uh, is at the parliament. Parliament, race doesn't exist in France and the parliament is a rampart against racism. Racism, you know, cannot penetrate um, a French institution. These are real um, rebuttal that are, were, were in, you know, coming from the media or from politicians. And next slide, the artist himself was featured in a documentary that, we have, that I participated in from the BBC and Arte, um, where he said this, it's not funny. I don't find this funny at all. I'm even doubting myself. This woman, me, an important scholar, is calling me an in unconscious racist. I don't understand. I was too hurt by that. An image is an image. It's a dream. It's an aesthetic. It's not reality. I don't understand why she could have been affected by what is not reality. And at this point, I just wanted to mention that I never called him an unconscious racist. I never questioned what his intentions. I My entire work, the questioning was on the object, which actually became impossible in France because the, the debate became so polarized on his personality and my personality that we never get actually to talk about the, about the, 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 the painting. So in France, art is free to shock. But my question was, what is what are irony and satire doing in a work commemorating a crime against humanity? Would that be acceptable for the official commemoration of the Paris 2015 terrorist attack or to eulogize soldiers who gave their life in Indochina, Algeria, or the world wars? What makes irony and satire acceptable to commemorate the abolition of slavery, a crime against humanity that is severely under discussed and under taught in France? And how does this exceptionalism around the representation of blackness and its ties to national memory affect the general treatment of black people in France and their conditional inclusion in the national community? This role also unveiled the problematic space offered to black female, uh, black French women in public debates. A professor with more than, at the time, 15 years of research under my belt, my profession was very rarely mentioned in the media. I was called an activist, a crazy woman, uh, you know, a, a French, uh, an American spy. In the French press and on comment boards online, uh, my co-author, Julien, who's a white man, almost disappeared as the the, this issue became my brainchild, a UFO driven by an alien set to destroy France. An NCONC study of close to 2,000 oppositional tweets sent to my account between April 4th and April 13th revealed that 28% were misogynistic, 30% were racist, 70% questioned my intelligence, and only 22% address the work itself. And many actually were, you know, had two or three of the, the, the thing um, uh, together. And w I received 2000 tweets and my co-author received 12. And actually half of them were to ask him if he wanted to be saved from uh, my, um, my, uh, my, uh, my hands. So in the book, I analyze how far from being anecdotal, 
the, the weeks of public outcry around the fresco actually highlighted the function of race as an enabler of what I call ghost racism. It's not racism in France. It's never racism. It's always something else. It's French culture. It's irony. It's satire. It's pragmatism. It's more aesthetically fitting. It's Black people's real futures, right? And tracing lines between these stances, these, you know, it's not racism, it's to the structural inequalities in, in health, law enforcement, you know, the, the relation be, um, between Black people in France and Black French to the national school system, to judicial system. Another thing um, that I look at, um, and this is where really I celebrated the Black voices and the Black female voices that made me and that, that I'm really interested that, you know, make the heart of my work is um, the work around healing. Next, next slide, please. Only five minutes. So I dropped and broke my favorite cereal bowl around Christmas Day 2021. Fall of 21 had been um, an unbelievably heavy time of loss, seeing the sudden transition of a handful of friends that for some I had just spoken to a few hours, days, or weeks before their departures. In the first day of 2022, I recreated the bowl through the Japanese art of kintsugi, also called kintsukoroi. Kintsugi is a technique for repairing porcelain or ceramic object using urushi, a lacquer mixed with gold. The repair objects draws its strength, beauty, and value precisely from the very fact of having been repaired and from the golden curves that weld all fractures by sublimating them. Kintsugi is not just about piecing together a broken object and covering the fracture with gold. Ceramic, if you do pottery, you know this, is a living object. And you want here to reach some type of symbiosis between the ceramic and the gold, like an organ transplantation, wanting to reduce the rejection of the graft. It is based on wabi-sabi, the acceptance of imperfection and of the natural cycle of life, birth, growth, decadence, as well as the possible transformation that lie within these voids, fractures, cracks, and silence. This bowl, once broken during a time of loss and death, is still serving breakfast. I had breakfast with it this morning. I use my pottery work to highlight what I call in, in, in this book, the ceramic memories that are effectively postcolonizing France's national jest. Grounded in an ethic of imperfection, fractures, and Gatarian ligne de fuite, they illuminate the radical healing gesture nested in the account of silence past. I consider collective memory as an artwork carefully polished and transmitted over the centuries by the artisan of national identity. At the heart of this system of power, silence functions as a necessary condition for the ordering of fact, the assemblement de la communauté. As we find ourselves in a moment of tension between the supremacy of a sedimented roman national and the reality of its recomposition, ceramic memories are created by the stifled meanders of the collective experience, Coromantin, Les Tirailleurs, Le Comte Charoy, Béanzin, Mafungo, Solitude, Sétif, Guelma, Herata, all the characters and pages torn from the French national novel, characters whose polycrystalline remains expose the transparency and cracks of the national memory material. In this economy, we no longer talk of repairs, as what has been taken away and broken is truly irreplaceable. Lives, generational wealth, futures, but rather talking of inscribing the breakage and erasure in the very process of refoundation it is no longer a question of repairing, of patching up what is falling into pieces, but of composing from the multiple, like the ceramist and its fruit of raw material. A clear illustration of this are the stratas metaphor used in my book by choreographer, French choreographer Bintou Dembele, in her reaction to the De Rosa fresco. Next slide, please. This is what she says. The presence of this object, the fresco, and now this defense by the institutions, it's like we're being excommunicated or that we do not exist or that we exist actually like that. What do we do after this? We are kept at the door at so many different levels, stratas that threaten to collapse on us if we don't confront them head on. Me, Bintou Dembele, daughter of Demba, I sit on top of them. I don't care and I do with it. I was born here and I'm from there. I'm neither here nor there half here, half there. All of us, you, me, Alice, Aya, our children, we are bits of that. 
My generation relied heavily on Black America to create our idea of Blackness. But an issue brought by the reliance on the African American experience and the general idea of Blackness is that it hid undercurrents that were extremely strong within Black communities in France, undercurrents that were visible in what I call in my book progressive and regressive Blackness. We might come into that during the Q&A. Another risk is the erasure of part of our history as it is already the case with Afrofeminism. If Bell Hooks and Audre Lorde have become household names in the past years, few people in France, and especially of my generation, younger generation, knew about Jean-Martin Sissé, Annette Bader Neuville, Paulette Nardal, Nardal is getting better, Eva et Jeanne Leroux, on trial with the Black Panthers, Angela Davis, Afeni Shakur, Shakur, both the media and swaths of the Afro world run with these references three more minutes, ignoring the UFM, Union des Femmes de Martinique, or the Rassemblement Féminin, both founded in 1944, the UFS, Union des Femmes du Sénégal, founded by Guinea's Jean-Martin Sissé and Senegal's Annette Bédarneville, both women who publicly rejected the UFS, Union des Femmes Françaises, seen as catering to the needs of white French women, these voices coming from all sides of the French Black Atlantic should not remain in the dark as they hold the keys to our common but dispersed past. Celebrating my sisters, saluting their lives and honoring matriarchs of the movement helped me address the racial divide at the heart of my vision of my own self, but at the heart of the construction of Frenchness at the national level. Today, I affirm that I'm Black, deeply African and also deeply French even though the second article of the French constitution forbade me from hyphenating my Frenchness, and even though whiteness continue to be the continues to be the untold norm of Frenchness. This positionality is one that I chose, one that arises from and opens radical origin of emancipation. I am from what they call the margins, but, and here I'm quoting Afro-German poet Maya Aim, I chose to move in and out of their so-called center when and when and how I want. The center and its institutions are heavy, and I wish to keep my ability to return to my center, their margins. My insertion of blackness, Africanness, and Frenchness open an horizon that disrupts the logic of coloniality and the idea that to belong is to be firmly anchored in one place. I write about the works of black feminists and black scholars like Yala Kisukidi, Jacqueline Couty, Annette Joseph Gabriel, Audrey Celestine, Cyliane Larcher. Miriam Paris. I write about the novels of Aya Sissoko, Dali Misha Touré, Fabienne Canor. I write about Bintou Dembele dancing from the Opera Bastille to Cayenne to Tubab Jalao to Chicago. I write on the cinema of Alice Job, Naomi Lehmial, Rosa Anjembe, works that unravel on stage, on film, in writing what it means to be Black and French, Black in France in the 21st century, what it is to grow up a woman and Black, a woman and Muslim, a woman and Maghrebi, a woman and Black and Muslim and veiled or poor and from the suburbs or from a small rural town. Our voices brings France to reopen pages long sealed. In order to, to think about our future, we will have to accept that we are in need of repair. We will have to talk about Haiti and Toussaint, we will have to explain why France ratified two abolitions. We will have to talk about the colonies, talk about these young men and women called in from the four corners of the empire to participate in wars and rebuild a battered France. We will have to unveil these individual stories and the way in which they cross the Grand Roman National. We will have to tell the stories of these young black and brown men and women stuck behind the Renault, Citroën and Peugeot assembly lines. These young men and women sweeping our streets and later parked in the banlieue where the police national regularly harassed their descendants. We will have to talk about this 13 year old black girl visiting the national assembly with her class about her pain and her humiliation as her classmates scoffed at two grotesque figures commemorating the abolition of slavery. I would like to finish by bringing back these words. Those who are dead are not ever gone. They are in the darkness that grows lighter. The dead are not down in the earth. They are in the trembling of the trees, in the water that runs. The dead are not dead. The dead are only gone when they have been forgotten. It is our responsibility to shed light on the darkness that threatens to engulf them, to keep the ground shaking and the water running, as to ensure that they are not covered for eternity by the stillness of silence and decay. Death is chaos. It marks the end of a life, of daily habits, 
the disappearance of familiar faces and voices, but it also gives birth to a new order, an order where these lives, daily habit, faces and voices hold the possibility of new beginnings, of all the readings of life itself. Thank you so much. And apologies for the extra two minutes. Sorry. <laughs> Mummy Fatu Niang, people didn't want to stop clapping then, and you're not here, but I want to tell you that you could hear a pin drop from start to middle to finish. So thank you so, so much. You brought such eloquence, grace, and beauty to such ugly topics. We are grateful to you. Thank you. Well, next, it's my great pleasure and privilege to hand you over to our next speaker, Dr. S. M. Rodriguez. They're going to talk about black feminism in Europe in relation to the migration of abolitionist movement philosophy. Please give a very warm welcome to S. M. Rodriguez. Thank you. <laughs> I want to also uh, extend my sincere thank you for the invitation to speak on this. Um, um, thank you, Professor Joanna Lewis. Thank you so much, uh, Mame Fato, for joining, uh, despite the circumstance, um, and to the LSE's European Institute, as well as uh, uh, Center for Women, Peace, and Security. Um, so I began writing and thinking about black feminism's uh, impact on Europe when I embarked upon a project, um, my in-progress book project that I have thus far called Abolition in the Academy. It began in 2017 with participant observation of scholar activist conferences and interviews of academics who identify as penal abolitionists around the world. This interview-based project included a few dozen university professors and lecturers who were embedded in the movements to end systems of policing, punishment, border patrol and encampment, psychiatric and medical incarcerations, and the surveillance systems that uphold segregation, dehumanization, and punishment. During the interviews, I met with scholars from Germany, the UK, and France, um, just to speak of those who are located within Europe and uh, discuss their sites of critique, their scholarly heroes, their desired impacts on their students and the communities around them. In the course of this project, I began to inductively code a new node on the historical imagination of the field. And I realized that the sources of inspiration for penal abolition um, were largely similar. Despite the difference in specific sites of research inquiry, whether the scholars were questioning borders or prisons or police, et cetera, the names listed very commonly included um, Angela Davis, for example, um, or Ruth Wilson Gilmore, but other black women with diverse relationships to Europe. Um, Davis, of course, was born in the US but educated in Germany and therefore able to synergize abolitionist philosophies from very different traditions. She's taken this analysis to critique apartheid over decades and criticize the role that police and prisons have in upholding regimes of violence. This led me to consider two different things, the range of topics to which the abolitionist critique stemming from black women applied and the proliferation of the abolitionist logic internationally. 
As I sought to understand the impact of black scholars on European located movements, I realized that to me, at least the travel of abolitionist movement philosophy is, like the goal of abolition, borderless. Ontologically, it, necess it necessitated a shift in thinking about European or even African and other geographic markers in their relationship to justice movement making. I began to think of migration and travel as inclusive of, but not limited to, physical bodies, and similarly, not moored in time. As such, I began to embark upon a project that could honor black feminist scholarship um, or intellectual presence, as well as black women's spiritual presence, physical presence, or otherwise on this continent. For a project called Disembodied Territories, headed by Sarah Salem um, of LSE Sociology and her collaborator, Mena Aga, I started an archival project, a hauntological project, to provide an analysis of what stays in this space, what haunts systems of violence in Europe, actors, actions, and historical moments from which so many young abolitionists in this country source ab uh, inspiration. Pictured here is Olive Morris, a London-based Jamaican immigrant, British Black Panther activist, and co-founder of the Brixton Black Women's Group in the 1970s. My colleague, Milo Miller, just edited a collection of the group's editorials, poetry, cultural, and political reflections from the time published just this month by Verso Books. So I just wanna give a shout out because I said I had my physical copy already and I wanted to make sure he believed me. Uh, so um, Olive's mark on London is indelible. Although she lived just 27 precious years before her martyrdom by the empire's medical neglect. When she was just 17 years old, she was brutalized by the police in detention for the state's version of what Gen Z may now call looking sus. That is, she was unjustly arrested due to suspicion that she was unruly as a black migrant and gender deviant. Her brutalization took the form of many others who I trace in this project um, under an analytic I call sexual corrections which I won't get into today. Um, but it was racialized and sexualized and enraging. However, I begin this project by destabilizing time, looking at another timeless figure. So I begin my storytelling there. I don't think it's coincidental that we just heard Solitude's name several times by the other speaker. And of course, I couldn't have anticipated that. So I'm gonna read an excerpt from the work. Perhaps when La Moulutresse Solitude de decides to fight, she holds her ballooning belly and hums a song of liberty to her unborn child. Guadeloupe has known freedom from enslavement for eight years due to the law of 4th of February, 1794. And yet Napoleon has decided to reinstate African enslavement to the benefit of French planters. Solitude, however, is known to be a maroon. While she was born into slavery, she lived her teen and adult years as a fugitive in a settlement away from the island's sugar and coffee plantations. But Napoleon's nearing navy carries the promise of chattel slavery for those racialized as black, threatening all but the planters on the island. Solitude's refusal of the return to slavery manifests in a steadfast determination to raise arms. Pregnant, she fights alongside Louis Delgré her revolutionary rage sparking legends. Before the insurgency ends, Solitude and the black rebels blast gunpowder stores, desperate for a lasting freedom in life or death. Unlike most others, she survives. She's captured and imprisoned. Solitude becomes immortal at the age of 30, giving birth in prison a day before execution. While the French colonizers imagine black value only in relation to the imperial economy, saving her son for his extractive value as an enslaved commodity, maroon knowledge leads us to imagine black lives matter for the very fact of being. It is this epistemology, this fugitive knowledge, that brings us to the time-defying, context-expanding abolitionist imagination. Like that call for abolition, la mulatresse has only multiplied. She stands as statues in Guadeloupe and more recently in Paris. 
The Parisian Monument to Solitude was birthed in the aftermath of Black Lives Matter rallies throughout Europe to rid itself of colonial nostalgia erected as statues of enslavers, imperialists, and brutalizers. In strong contrast to the public recognition or celebration of European colonial uh, heritage, Solitude's defiant posture offers young abolitionists the possibility of imagining a lasting resistance to racial capitalism. The international Black Lives Matter movement impacted the rebirth of Solitude's story in Paris in 2022. After years of struggle as a movement that began in 2013, yet relies on life worlds created by centuries of struggle for African sovereignty, life, and joy. I believe much can be told through solitude's haunting half-life. The abolitionist spirit revives through movement organizations such as Black Lives Matter, which dedicates its website to imagining abolition, understood as the project of organizing an alternative social infrastructure capable of ending systems of racialized deprivation and violence. It endeavors to raise consciousness of the possibility of sustaining life amid death worlds, but also to ending the death world rendered by carcerality. By death worlds, I refer to Achille Mbembe's concept that describes the new, and this is a quote, new and unique forms of social existence in which vast populations are subjected to conditions of life conferring upon them the status of the living dead. They are physical, political, and social formations that subject African people to perpetual loss, injury, and early death. I use it to advance a speculative geography, a way to remap our connections away from the merely physical realities of land masses and oceans. The current penal abolitionist project is one such struggle against the death world, focusing primarily on prisons, policing, medicalized and psychiatric incarceration, border patrol, and encampment. Many within the movement situate these deadly spaces and practices in a time continuum of enslavement and coloniality. I ask, how can we recenter the transnational legacy of African women's resistance to carceralism to better understand their contribution to today's abolitionist imagination? Alongside Annie Finks and Wangui uh, Kimari, I consider carceralism the social mechanism that, quote, def uh, defining and determining criminality and authorizing spatial, temporal, and material modes of punishment end quote, which reanimates coloniality through inordinate surveillance, arbitrary detention, and zones of separation. The stories cited here serve as sites of resistance to colonial punishment, such as involuntary servitude, imprisonment, immigrant detention, displacement, and their political economic underpinnings. In turn, the sites of resistance, I argue, speak to penal, penal abolition, defined not as the movement against oppressive institutions, but that which seeks to end the ideologies that uphold and reanimate them. The history of prison itself is deeply intertwined with colonial administration and systems of control. Prisons are crucial to maintaining the imperial and neo-imperial economy as the forced labor within it sustains war and reinforces the coloniality of race and gender. The mushrooming of the total institution works to regularly employ banishment from the community or a social ex execution, which during pre-colonial times would have been a last resort rather than a default response to social offenses. Incarceration rates for African women around the world have risen sharply and often rely on allegation and indigence rather than any infraction of the law. Therefore, we must be deeply critical of the function of prisons in society and the global commitment to social control through carcerality. Abolitionist feminist Angela Davis argues that gender structures the prison. The very design, function, and logic of, the, of prisons are set upon gendered ideologies that emphasize a natural binary, imbue privileged assumptions and forms of differentiated punishment for people coded men, women, or otherwise gender deviant. One such assumption embedded within the prison structure is that normal, natural women are less inclined to engage in criminalized behavior. This assumption leads to the pathologization of the few who end up incarcerated, particularly the poor, the queer, the sexual, and the racialized. 
It encourages different reformational, reformational actions as corrective control. These reformatory practices include homesteading, cooking and cleaning, tending to animals and laundry and, and textile services, therefore punitively reinforcing socially constructed gender roles. However, we must ground rehabilitation in its necessary precursor of pathologization and understand that punishment and incapacitation continue to coexist with, if not supersede, the reformatory logic. Detained women have been referred to as crazy, unstable, hysterical, or even uh, witches by British colonial administration in Kenya and in our various home regions. As such, rehabilitation often looks like forced psychiatrization and medicalizing women's reform. These medicines may create embodied prisons within the, Im the imprisoned body. To rehabilitate is to identify a fundamental unwellness, a wrongness in someone and restore them to be the ablest, racist, sexist, ageist, imagined ideal version of themselves. It not only ignores structural conditions that lead to many criminalized acts, but it also displaces blame on survivors of violence for their trauma. Doing time is imagined to correct behaviors, but not the societal cultures that reproduce harm such as domestic abuse, rape culture, poverty, etc. Notably, in some African indigenous sensibilities, doing time means suffering awayness and irreparable severing from the sense of the collective self. Furthermore, women's imprisonment is incapacitative on various levels. First, removing purportedly deviant women from society preserves the idea and image of the pure woman and isolates surplus women from greater society during their potentially reproductive years. The extra legal punishments received while incarcerated are well doc documented, especially the rates of sexual assault, which traumatize those incarcerated. This carceral trauma is disabling, thereby structurally, physically, and psychologically altering the public participation of people of all genders who are considered surplus. As such, anti-carceral feminists argue that societal disablement is a cyclical project. Structural neglect and carcerality exist outside of the prison and then funnel women into the further disabling environment of the prison. They are then ejected, traumatized, back into society, less able to, fulfill, to live fulfilling and dignified lives. Therefore, many argue that women's imprisonment supports the aims of eugenics, removing the racialized, poor, queer, and disabled women, or disabled, from the public in the short term and in a progressive eugenicist sense. This argument is only supported by the critical scholarship into the practices of abortion, sterilization, and antenatal neglect in carceral facilities. However, in a more general sense, we must understand that women's imprisonment serves to stop the quote-unquote unruly African figure from challenging the social order of white supremacy. This social death or expulsion from humanity is a facet of necropolitics that we need to recenter to understand the strategic silencing of women of African descent. Black feminist hauntology allows us to trace the ever-changing formations of anti-colonial resistance as transcendent and metamorphical shape-shifting as ghosts or hauntings. So while racial violences shape, they do not wholly define black worlds. This is according to Catherine McKittrick. That is, despite the haunting institutionalization of white supremacist violence, black feminism haunts white supremacy. This is a quote from Vivian Salehana. The hauntological quality of my analysis rests in the destabilization of time and lifespan, especially the lifespan of philosophical and spiritual presence. The narrative connects the lasting structures of penal harm while simultaneously uplifting the immortal shape-shifting of resistance. The afterlives of these women and their work timelessly display the power to affect and unsettle the colonial carceral diaspora. In Notting Hill, London, steel pans are beaten by African migrants from the Caribbean islands. The joyous music moves through and rises above a crowd of over a million celebratory carnival goers. Its rhythm migrates from West Africa and Central Africa to Trinidad and the Southern Caribbean to England, surviving generations of force, desperation, and deportation. So too does Claudia Jones. In founding the event, 
She writes, a people's art is the genesis of their freedom. Much as today's penal abolitionist philosophy arises from a general critique of capitalist social structures that, quote, rely heavily on the existence of a surplus labor population. This quote is from Vivian Salehana, which I just, I will continue saying this name because black feminist ontology is that crucial to understanding this project. She imagines, Claudia Jones this is, um, who's actually sitting on the far left, um, that England's police brutality, white supremacy, and brutal capitalism can be brought down by united African peoples. Claudia, born in Port of Spain, Trinidad, begins the West Indian Gazette in London after she is deported from New York City. As many freedom fighters of African descent in the 19th and 20th centuries, she is a communist. Her indefatigable organizing power and political presence in the USA leads her to serve time for the Alien Registration Act, a law in place to criminalize advocating the overthrow of the US government. Between the carcerality of poverty, gender, and disability, and her actual incarceration, she lives in an archipelago of carceral cells. She is ordered to be deported under the Subversive Activities Control Act of 1950, and she's sent here to London rather than her natal home. The hearings occur as she is twice held between 1948 and 1950 at Ellis Island, a federally owned immigrant detention island overlooked, ironically, by the Statue of Liberty. Between the hearings and her deportation, she enters a seven-year cycle of arrest, hospitalization, commutation, or bail-based release. Her heart begins to fail before she reaches 40 years old. Beyond the bars and the bail and her breaking heart, her spirit triumphs indomitable. She writes poetry while incarcerated. While this I know, my heart rebels at screens that shut off sunlight's beams. My thoughts too rise like tinkling bells to welcome shafts of light in seams. And as such, Claudia Jones etches herself into the archive as a force of nature. Her will simulates sun rays and illuminates paths forward beyond the structures that encage her body. Claudia's work demonstrates a black sense of place, reflecting the process of materially and imaginatively situating historical and contemporary struggles against practices of domination and the difficult entanglements of racial encounter as defined by Catherine McKittrick. Her public anti-imperialism, anti-capitalism, and anti-racism migrates with her, and her practice and imagination expand as carcerality forces her both into and out of place. Like fellow imprisoned poet Asada Shakur, Joan spends her life writing for personal and collective survival. It's actually um, just a side note that she actually um, shares a place uh, in terms of she was imprisoned in the same space that Asada Shakur was imprisoned in just a few years after her. That was a side note, sorry. Uh, so the West Indian Gazette becomes known as the first major black magazine in England, publishing Afro-Asian Caribbean news, especially about racial violence in Britain and global decolonial politics. Claudia and her team of editors maintained the monthly publication for six years between its founding and Claudia's earthly departure. However, Claudia's presence remains through the sound system staged in Notting Hill on the first day of carnival after the global pandemic of COVID-19, which is when I took this photo. Like Olive and Claudia, who passed early at the juncture of structural neglect, chronic illness, and disability, the COVID-19 pandemic disproportionately impacted people of African descent in England. When August comes and it is time for the parade, festival goers crowd together, mixing the spirit of Claudia's message. When slow death is most apparent, so too must be our resilience and our joy. The African diaspora begins as a story of force, migration, labor, and racial identification but lives as a story of resistance and connection. When the markers of force have shifted rather than died, the resistance and connection have only amplified. What black political womanhood offers us is a look at how resistance moves across borders and then inspires new generations of movements. 
Even when meant to be defeated or deported, the revolutionary spirit lives on. It mushrooms in exile. To return to Vivian Salehana's words, African women's political struggle does not experience death, but rather it haunts white supremacy. What this haunting gifts us is the vision, truth, and possibility of abolition. According to Dylan Rodriguez, abolition is a dream toward futurity vested in insurgent counter-civilizational histories, genealogies of collective genius that perform liberation under conditions of duress. For Liat Ben Moshe, abolition requires a dis-epistemology, a letting go of attachments to clairvoyance, and expertise and the hyper-specific and formulaic demands for replacement institutions. Those who have let go, who live renounced like Maroons, hold transformative knowledge. As abolition requires the end of dehumanization, Wando Achebe reminds, of, reminds us of this Igbo saying, he who will hold another down in the mud must stay in the mud in order to keep him down. She explains, the revocation of someone's human rights forces an unaliving, an unhumaning, unbeing onto them, which forces all, oppressed and oppressor, to lose the beauty of their being. We only reach our full humanity when we uphold and collectively sustain the humanness of others. As such, I look at the African indigenous epistemologies that have traveled and propagated possibilities for the humanity of others throughout the diaspora. These epistemologies have undoubtedly impacted the entire body of penal abolitionist literature, despite the ethnicities of the respected authors. The women discussed here demonstrate an abolitionist praxis and thought without necessarily uttering the word abolition. Solitude fights for the imperialist prospect of racialized forced labor. Claudia fuses communist and racial justice organizing at the grassroots and within political structures of the state while retaining a borderless analysis. They demand that we critically interrogate structural in inequities. They position strategy and consideration alongside urgent action. They demonstrate uncompromising will. All is, insist upon fighting for collective liberation before the future outcome is settled or even imagined. Live free or die are the last words solitude is believed to have uttered. A dictum we can believe guides black feminism's unending rebellions. That was brilliant. Thank you so much. You brought so much eloquence, so much power and, and insight. Uh, and, and again, we see in these heartbreaking examples the strength of spirit, of intellect, of the power of the afterlife that is so much stronger than these histories of repression and brutality that are with us today. So thank you so much. We've got time for questions, so I'm going to pass over to you, the audience. It is now your turn to have your say and to respond, and we want to hear from you. So, I'm really glad that uh, we've also got uh, Madame Fouté with us back. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, some questions then, please. Um, we're going to do the usual LSE thing and take three in a row. So... Thank you both very much. That was so enlightening, very grateful. My question is for Professor um, Nyang in uh, Carnegie Mellon. And as an aside, I was at Brown at the same time that you were, and also took Trisha Rose's class. And thank oh you God. for, thank you for mm -hmm. TAing my French class. <laughs> 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 my question is, um, my understanding is that it's very difficult to demonstrate racial inequalities in France in large part because there is not data and the government is very resistant to the standardization or collection of data on race. Can you, can, is that the case and can you speak to what's being done to maybe combat that? 
Is this David? Yep. <laughs> wow. Ici, oh là! Ah, je vais pleurer! <sighs> Action I was going for, so <laughs> I'll take the answer offline. That's beautiful. Incroyable! Oh my goodness! I need a moment. <laughs> Incroyable, mais toi là, attends que je t'attrape. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about this question. You know, um, in in the last chapter, the last part of the book is on healing reparation, right? And when I talk of reparation, of course, I'm um, linking it to the, you know, the global conversation, especially. Um, post George Floyd, but also before George Floyd in France, we had, um, you know, lots of conversation around, um, you know, museums and um, return of stolen objects. So, you know, just thinking about the, the conversation on reparation. And one of the arguments that we hear in the uh, debate, uh, in this debate, the first one is repairing what? There's nothing to repair. I mean, right? That's just the topic of um, my book, Universalism. I mean, universalism is perfect. It's the perfect system. What do you want to repair? You want thing to touch this means that you actually want to contaminate it. You want to attack it, right? You have this vision of um, society that is racialized when race does not exist. So, and this is something that I heard a lot during the fresco uh, hoopla, like, the race doesn't exist by calling this object racist, you are the racist. So the very fact of refusing that we need to address an issue, that we need to address the glaring disparities um, in, in you know, the, the over representation of minorities, racialized black, brown, Muslim kids in, in jails. Um, so there's nothing to repair. And my first point to that is, that for example, when you look at universalism, um, we're told that it was perfect, it was perfect since its inception, 1789, 1792, but universalism, um, coexisted with slavery, right? Slavery was not abolished before 1794, then it was reinstated, then abolished again in 1848, which by the way, I never learned in France. I learned that in the US. Um, poor people could not vote. Um, universalism coexisted with um, a second, like de facto second class status for people in Algeria on the basis of their Muslimness. Um, universalism, I mean, women couldn't vote until 19. 44. So you have the react, you have the the theory of what people are saying. You know, this is perfect. It needs to be protected from you know people trying to change it. But the reality is, are we living? I mean, is the reality on the ground the uh, you know parallel with, with this principle? So and that's really my point. Where I'm not going to wait for people to start realizing that we are actually in need of repair to make the move. And that's the conversation that we're having, for example, with data, right? We are not going to have data. We don't want um, race-based or um, religion-based data because France is uh, uh, liberté, égalité, fraternité. But if we don't know what we're talking about, if we cannot put numbers, how do we know that we have um, a problem to solve? So, and you know, I'm, I was just playing with all these ideas in this in this book. Um, it's not that pe because people don't see a problem that we don't have a problem, and I'm not going to wait until people realize that we have a problem and give me their solution to bring the, the one that they have. And for example, uh, one of the exam and I'm going to, to stop here. One of the uh, example that I give is police violence. We spend decades, and when I say decades, it's not just us in metropolitan France. I'm talking about police violence in the colonies, denouncing police violence. And uh, my first book, uh, two chapters were on police violence. And I'm always, I mean, you are that I'm mixing the situation in the US with the situation in France because there's no such thing as police violence. Enters 2018 and the Gilets Jaunes movement. And for the first time we are seeing on live TV white grandmothers being hit by cops in broad daylight. For the first time, we're seeing white people who look like, you know, every day's, you know, everybody's uncle, everybody's aunt, nurses being, you know, enucleated, losing their eyes. And I often share this clip with my students of a journalist on CNews. It's one of the 
main channel in France, going crazy when he saw tanks. And he said, what is this? We've never seen tanks. You know, the last time we saw tanks in Paris were um, during the Second World War. As someone who grew up in the banlieue, I grew up around this. I mean, the banlieues are militarized. This is what, and it just shows why right, the, the difference between of experiences. And then he go on by saying that the, the um, um, uh, flashballs that were used by the French police during the Gilets Jaunes movement were reserved to the banlieue. I mean, they were not supposed to use that in Paris, in the city. So police violence became a reality to people finally in 2018 because it was touching white bodies. So just, you know, to give a short answer, I'm sorry, I'll try to make a shorter answer. It's not because others don't want to recognize the reality of what we're denouncing that we are not going to find solutions because we might have been told that blackness doesn't exist, that you cannot be black and French. But the reality of my existence is that I am black and French and I know that I exist. I'm here, right? And I've known for as long as I've existed, I've known how to address my dream, how to think. And my grandmother's um, was a big part of that. So I, I've had solutions and I'm, this is, you know, this is what we're doing in, in my books and in Alice's films and in Bintu, bringing solutions to, to problems that I, are now becoming everybody's problem increasingly and not just the, the problems of black people or the banlieue or Muslims. Thank you so much. That was a, a lovely question. We've got no questions yet online. So please, uh, audience, jump in. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for the amazing talk. I have a question for uh, Professor S.M. Rodriguez. Um, carcerality is often uh, linked to the idea of serving justice. So my question is that when we, uh, when we are working on penal abolition, do we require a radical delinking of carcerality and justice? And if so, what does this new um, alternative imagination for justice entail or what would you say rethinking justice would entail? Are we no longer doing the three format, by the I way? I think these questions are, it, but... yeah, they're, okay. so, they're so awesome. <laughs> Deep dive sure. in. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you so much for the question. Uh, of course, it, it requires a radical delinking of um, a form of justice, a few forms of justice that we um, are, our states are saturated, right, with logics of um, particularly retributive justice. Um, and um, I'd say incapacitative justice. So in criminological literature, we tend to address um, or think of justice through various kind of motivations. Um, so there are different ways to understand what a, a justice system may be working toward um, when it moves through punishment, right? And so retributive justice, for example, is kind of like an eye for an eye, right? It's a very, um, it's imagined to be a measured form of harm that the state gives on behalf of its citizenry to a person who has committed a harm. And harms can be broken down, right? Obviously, there are physical harms, but there are also social ones um, uh, or material, which is going to be the most common, right? Um, you know, material or harm as in like um, theft. Um, and so the, the state steals right, in order to punish someone who has stolen, right? And that stealing could be um, under the language of a fine, for example. Um, uh, but obviously, it can also be time. So in this, right, because the state has what uh, would be called a monopoly on legitimate violence, it doesn't actually, um, it's, it's uncommon for us to apply uh, criminalized language like theft to the state, right? This is kind of, this is the work of revolutionaries though, right? Oftentimes saying, you have kidnapped my child, right? And they might say, I have detained this child, 
you see. Um, kidnapping, right, being criminalized language. The state using legitimize, uh, le legitimized language. Um, anyways, all to say, that type of thought, right, punitive thought, is so embedded culturally that it's actually really hard to break through and um, reconsider what might be necessary for justice. The forms of justice that abolitionists um, usually uh, discuss or engage are transformative justice. So this is a form of justice that reimagines what the root cause of the harm is and attempts to address that condition, right? And so if we're thinking about theft again, why did someone steal becomes a more important question than how do I hurt you for stealing, you see? Um, transformative justice then uh, uh, looks at um, several things, perhaps decriminalizing, um, and so in that way, actually getting rid of criminal, um, you know, laws, ideologies, and sanctions, um, because we are constantly expanding what is and is not a crime, right? So crime is socially constructed, it's ever expanding. Every year we are adding new and new crimes, right, so that we can create more and more criminals, <laughs> right? So decriminalizing is one kind of aspect of that. Um, but the other is actually also um, what would be considered a positive abolition, which would be what institutions, um, organizations, or efforts need to be in place in order to stop harm, right? And so rather, of think, rather than thinking through crime, we think through harm. You see, um, so that's one form, transformative justice. Another kind of constitutive justice, um, um, and that might actually be related uh, maybe to some of uh, Dr. Myung's work is um, healing justice. Um, healing justice is imagined as a necessary form of justice for people um, in the aftermath of harm. Um, but also communities that have been harmed for a long time in order to repair the kind of communal ideals, but also to try and interject some type of support into what we would, um, the societal disablement project that I was saying, right? Um, or what Lauren Borlant might call slow death. So healing justice kind of attends to what it means to create a healthy community. Um, so all to say, there are, there's a lot of really incredible thought that's happening to nuance a conversation around justice and divorce it from this idea that we have that's given from the state that justice is somehow served when someone is harmed on the behalf of someone who has been harmed without actually dealing with how I experience my own healing after I've been harmed, right? The state has no provision for that. And also, how do you move someone out of the circumstance in which they are in a kind of perpetual cycle, perhaps, of harming, right? Which the state does not enable when it, in, when it incarcerates or when it hurts someone, right? So those are the kinds of um, interventions that abolitionists are making in scholarship. Thank you, Asun. Any more questions? Yes, we've got one online. Thanks, Emily. So I have a question from um, someone in the online audience, Emily Sams, who is an LSE alum. Um, and her question is for Dr. S.M. Rodriguez. How do we theorize and apply black feminist abolitionist principles in a time where academic freedom is threatened, such mm -hmm. as removal of critical race studies and gender studies from academic spaces? I'm sorry, before you give that microphone back, could you just repeat it one more time and who it's from? I, I just couldn't hear you Certainly. quite as well. It's from Emily Sams, right. who is an LSE <laughs> alum. Okay. And the question is, how do we theorize and apply black feminist abolitionist principles in a time where academic freedom is threatened, such as removal of critical race studies and gender studies from mm -hmm. academic spaces? Mm. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, I, I believe Emily Sams is on 
her way to doing this work herself. So it's a funny question. Um, thank you for the question, Emily. Um, so I would point you in the direction of a few, um, well, I guess in, in two different directions. One, we can look at the situation that's happening in Florida, for example, where there are these um, kind of great forms of um, censorship that is occurring. Um, with all of this stop woke legislation um, that's popularizing around the United States, forcing many academics to leave, just leave, because they actually cannot be, um, they can't retain their jobs within those um, spaces because all of the metrics of evaluation that secure a job in uh, the United States um, academic system, such as the system of tenure, which requires that you meet certain standards of evaluation, lest you lose your job, which is a really important kind of caveat. Um, so when it's now um, illegal for you to um, use a conference on black feminism, for example, right, that attendance as something that contributes to your profile as a scholar, you lose your ability to um, remain on the tenure track and or successfully pass promotion. Now, in this context, you must be promoted in order to keep your job. You will not be hired with those types of conference presentations, for example. Um, so just to say, when we are dealing with, you know, or, or, or kind of framing um, uh, this, you know, attack on academic freedom in different spaces, it is to note that this is something, you know, these kind of uh, neo-fascist movements, regimes, etc., are actually um, mushrooming in various circumstances. We are also obviously uh, increasingly facing that here in this context um, in the UK, uh, when we cannot, we are being politically silenced on massive levels um, around any analysis of apartheid, of segregation, of punishment, and how um, uh, securitization may work for settler colonial regimes. I would say there, there's a long history of black feminist thought that is working um, to name what these kind of cycles of violence are despite um, the attacks on academic freedom um, and the politicization of knowledge writ large. Um, one way that that looks like though is unfortunately has been leaving the academy. Um, from the interviews that I was doing and the observations uh, that happened to many, particularly women of color in my data set. Disproportionate impact on women of color. It's interesting. I could add just, just one thing um, to this from the French perspective. Actually, there's something very interesting because um, all the conversations that are happening right now on academic freedom, of course, here in the United States, and it was great that you, know, that you mentioned Florida. By the way, uh, thank you. I forgot to tell you this. I was mesmerized by your paper. There was so, there's so, much, so many echoes between uh, both our work. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rodriguez. But, um, you know, we talk a, a lot about this, you know, in the past years in the U.S., in, um, in the U.K., but in France, this conversation, of course, um, in the past two years, we had this revival post George Floyd's death with the Islamo leftist movement, the wokeist movement. But France took care of this a long time ago by just simply not having something called ethnic studies. Um, there is zero department of ethnic studies in France. There is zero department of black studies. So the only way we could, I could study uh, blackness in France was to actually go in the US, which is one of the, uh, we are working on a database of um, French researchers working on blackness in France. And so far, 87% of the names that we have, we have close to 200 names, are in the US. So our country took care of that by just simply not allowing that. But this is the other thing. We have 154 departments of Black American, African American studies. So one of the thing that we, one of the tools that we've developed, and here I am not, you know, um, bringing out a secret. One of the tools that we've developed in France is to basically approach the study of blackness, critical race theory in France through um, this department of African-American studies. We have very developed department. I mean, we have this obsession in France with understanding anti-blackness, 
in the US with understanding racism and in the US. Those are funded. And bizarrely, the wokeist accusation are oftentimes geared toward scholars working on blackness in France, because remember, race doesn't exist. You're basically working on a chimera and you're creating a problem that doesn't exist. You want to work on black people in South Africa? Great. You want to work on critical race theory, the old bad things that Americans are doing to black people then and now? Amazing. You want to work on critical race theory in France? This is not, this. it doesn't exist. You're creating on top of your head. So one of the things, and I'm just going to finish on that, that we found, and I really like that you mentioned the, the the fact of having to leave the academia. I mean, when you think about the radical possibilities that are left by the academia, you know, decolonizing the academia means, I think that, you know, the, the last end might be just leaving, because is it actually possible to decolonize the institu this institution? But one of the tools that we've developed, and, um, and I just created last year a Center for Black European Studies, we've discovered that basically it might be very hard for a Black Danish woman to work about blackness in Denmark, but it will be possible in France. And a French, black French woman cannot work on critical race theory in France. It will be made impossible, but she can do it in the US. And a black American woman who can't work on, on this in Texas or in Florida can go do it in Sweden, in Sweden. So really, and this is really giving lots of oxygen air for the need to work on a transatlantic global vision because and and I mean we're really just starting to to look at those those channels but um yeah so it's one of the tools that we're looking at thank you so much uh, for that we've got time for one more question anybody okay. yes thank you um, hi, um, I have a question for Professor Asam Rodriguez. Um, back kind of to the question of um, interventions, transformative justice, and other forms of um, non-punitive justice. Um, I'm curious, this is a big question, so I might come to office hours at some point, honestly. Um, and I'll try to context contextualize it quickly. Um, I'm very interested in this, particularly in non-punitive response to um, like sexual harm, yeah. and particularly in feminist spaces and how controversial that is, but how important it is to think about non-punitive response and abolitionist response. Um, with my own experience at like another university and advocacy, we tried to implement like a restorative justice process, and there was kind of a, a ruining of what in this case, what could be like compared to as the state, the university thought of, of how that process was to run. And it was kind of equated to mediation and that's not the same thing at all. And it usually is um, punitive in different ways and it's basically ruined. The reason I give this context is because I am curious on your thoughts or any references to other academics and literature that you might have on how that actual intervention process works when these states and institutions can't conceptualize it or don't want to conceptualize it in a way that is actually reparative. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that makes sense, but. It does, and um, if I don't exactly make sense of it, I will say that I'll just say a lot of things and hope something lands. Uh, <laughs> um, no, uh, you know, this, this is something I think of a, a lot, and so I'm, I'm absolutely um, happy for your question, um, particularly because a common attack against abolitionist thought or decarceration um, is what about the, the rapists and murderers? I mean, so often it is that. And that is, that's just, you know, then someone drops a mic and they're like, I won. Yeah. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Like, it's that simple. Um, and yet, right, and yet we have done prison for a very long time, a, a, an environment that institutionalizes and ritualizes and proliferates rape. Right? It only operates off of sexual assault from the moment that you are in, and we are doing cavity searches and anal searches and this and that, right? To the moment of actually being observed at all times, right? Everything that we would consider sexual violence occurs at the institutional level, right? 
but then also occurs with the, in the tacit um, sanctioning, the, the, the even appreciation of punitive um, uh, workers within it, right, who are um, um, not just complicit in, but often encouraging of, and often the actual perpetrators of sexual harms within prisons. Um, we are also uh, complicit on the outside, as rape jokes are, are, are most common when people talk about particularly men going to prison. Um, so sexual harm is not in any way ameliorated by the threat of prison. Prison in and of itself is operated by violence workers in order to do state violence on two people. And that is not um, something that, uh, you know, is limited to those who um, uh, do sexual abuse, right? Um, I think another really important point about this is that um, prisons are here, right? Another a, a form, uh, you know, a, a um, justice kind of ideology that, that is used to uphold criminal justice systems is this theory of deterrence, right? The, the fact that punishment exists and looms over our head will actually stop us um, from uh, uh, committing harms, right? Because we're inherently um, evil and, and harmful people. Um, now, that explicitly cannot hold when we talk about or think deeply about sexual violence because rape culture exists and because the vast majority of people who commit sexual assault of any form never see the inside of the cell. There's no threat of it. And the most systematic abusers are the ones who are in positions of power, right? Um, so the very people who could never be incarcerated, right? There is no threat of their incarceration because they're actually the most valued members of our capitalist societies. So very importantly, sorry, that's my little caveat. Now I'll actually answer your question. Um, so non-punitive responses to sexual harm are um, uh, embedded in a belief that sexual violence thrives on shame and silence. Right, shame and silence. When you think about what punishment accomplishes and the threat of punishment accomplishes, it is shame and it is silence, right? So the idea that someone, uh, <clears throat> we can take um, um, you know, an example um, of uh, abuse within a family, right? Now, because the state's intervention has nothing to do with healing, right, of the, the person um, who's being harmed, but everything to do with the kind of disruption, detention, and therefore segregation of the harm doer, then a family has to consider, right, whether or not, one, that is actually happening, right, and the fear of finding out whether or not that happens is, or is happening, lest we be wrong, you see, that is shrouded in shame, right? So there is actually um, a counter deterrent effect of incarceration and punitive kind of forms of violence on that family ever saying that something harmful might be happening. This is particularly true in instances of childhood sexual assault. So the threat of prison or of punitive justice actually does the opposite of what we would want it to do in encouraging a reparative response without the threat that someone might be taken out of their family and their family irreparably damaged on potentially a false accusation or potentially a racialized um, uh, uh, a form of punishment that has nothing to do with what is actually happening. And then thirdly, can we afford to lose this person from our family? You see, those three different levels of consideration are all there when we're thinking specifically on retributive justice and relying on retributive justice to end sexual violence. It cannot do it. The, no the next iteration and one that I think matters a lot to people here, of course, childhood sexual abuse should matter a lot to everyone here, but I'm saying um, while we're here sitting in a college campus, right, is of course co college uh, campus-based sexual assault and violence. This is very, very common. Um, if we are operating under the assumption that one in four, 
right? One in four women on a college campus, right, are going to experience some type of sexual assault. We have to, have to contend with the possibility that one in four, right, and this is considering the dark figure, so certainly more, one in four people are doing some sexual abuse on campus. Do you see what I'm saying? The criminal justice system is wholly inadequate to deal with sexual violence, and it does not want to deal with sexual violence for campuses because it believes that these men in particular are the future of the country. Do you see? There's, there, it's a complete counter deterrent. The logic in and of itself cannot uphold because the logic was not built to actually lead to any type of accountability for sexual assault. It was built for very various crimes, right? Largely against the state or against the religion. And instead it backtracked, right? These different um, uh, uh, crimes that would become crimes only later in the day, right? Onto the system that already existed to uphold the people who were in power, you see? So what does it do, right? What is a system that is here to protect the wealthy do <laughs> when we are actually, um, uh, you know, when a, a social movement, for example, like a feminist movement, moves to criminalize different harms that they are concerned with, rightfully concerned with, you see? It actually can't deal with that because it's like, oh man, actually, we really just like getting poor people um, and people of color, like migrants, cool. Um, but that's like, you know, like potentially our next prime minister, you know what I mean? Like, I can't get that guy. You see, so the fact that the, the criminal justice system is actually not formed in this way to deal with sexual violence means that we have to think through what transformative violence might look like. And a really good resource for this, sorry, I'm landing the plane right now, um, is Generation 5. Okay, Generation 5. Um, they have a massive, beautiful toolkit for understanding how this applies, why this whole idea of upholding criminal justice systems um, to protect from rape, right? Why would we have a, a, a monument to rape constructed in order to stop people from committing this is absurd. And why specifically in instances of sexual violence, we need to consider a different route. That's your question. I'm sorry I'm going to have to stop things here when the discussion is you know, just really taking off and I can see by the audience that you're just hanging on every word and we really want to talk more about these issues more often and despite where the fact that we're hearing about such traumatic subjects, such traumatic histories, uh, we're talking about ghosts, we're talking about half-lives, afterlife, we're talking about death, nevertheless paradoxically I hope that you will get so much sense of vitality, of life and hope from our two speakers, from the examples that they have used and from their superb scholarship. Because this uh, talk is about honouring the matriarchs of the movement, I really want to end with thanking SM Rodriguez for her fantastic, uh, for your fantastic talk. But also, I really want to give the last word, I think, to Dr. Miami Fatu Nyai and to um, finish the session for us. Is there anything you'd like to say? Fine. Can I just say that I would have loved to be with you, but um, you know, I'm a very spiritual person, and I think that we were together in spirit. And I really like, you know, that you were uh, you you emphasized the. Um, this conversation is cyclical, right? Cyclical. So it means that we we will touch on 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 suffering. We will touch on um, things that hurt. We will touch on things that make us make us think. But this is what life is about. And what comes always goes back. Always, you know, always what always what goes always come back. So um, um, I hope that you know that you you had the uh, students had um, and and the audience had a great time with us. And life goes on. Life goes on. And just one one last thing, um, just one last thing before I go. Um, I often hear people say, uh, pay attention to your strong friends. And we don't always pay, we hear those words and we don't pay attention. If you have someone around you who's very strong, pay attention to them and make sure that they are okay. Thank you. Thank you.
and thank you all. Thank you.